Hey guys, I'm Jay. This is SmartHelping.com. I've got an awesome new B2C SaaS model that I'm going to add to my SaaS template library at SmartHelping.com. So this was built off my original um, B2B, B2C model. I've added a ton to it and I've structured it in this certain way. It's for a an example scenario of an AI powered financial advisory platform. But in general, you could use this for any type of B2C business uh, startup model to try to plan out your financial forecast projections. And this is going to be a long video. It's in-depth. There's a lot to go through. And I want to explain. I think sometimes I might go too fast. So I want to explain every uh, single assumption and talk about it a little bit so that you get a feel for how the general flow works. And that will actually save you a lot of time as you're using this template uh, because you won't have to uh, really search for what things mean or wh how something is. I'll, I'll be explaining it all right here, right off the bat. So we'll go through each tab. The yellow tabs are mainly all the assumption tabs. All the other tabs are summaries. Um, so the first set are assumptions and we have a three statement model monthly and annual income statement balance sheet cash flow statement and then as you go to the right there's um, an executive summary tab a discounted cash flow analysis tab visuals monthly and annual detail as you go further over the five matrix tabs are how all the logic works dynamically and then the validation tab has some things for the date population and drop downs as well as retention and this is actually a very important tab um, we'll go through all of these in depth as um, I move through the video. So first tab, global control, company name. This is just going to go on top of the financial statements. Not super important, but you can name it whatever you want or just something generic. Second input, very important. This is your launch year. Whatever year you put in here is going to drive the fiscal years um, on the like, income statement. And the model always starts on the first month of whatever year you put in here. It doesn't mean the revenue and expenses start in this month. Do not change this. Actually, do not change this cell. You will mess up the balance sheet. Uh, now, if you're just using the monthly and annual detail and you don't care about the, these financial statements, then you could change this just visually so you can see on the monthly detail. You just don't want this to be January. This could be some other month, whatever. That's fine. But to get the balance sheet to work, these fiscal dates matter, and it has to start each first year. It has to start with the first month of that year. Uh, but like I said, you can adjust as we go through here. The start month of when revenue, traffic starts, costs, all that stuff is dynamic. So you don't have to, those won't start at the first month necessarily. They could, they could, and it depends on how you adjust it. End month, this is when all data stops for the model. So you could do any month within a five year time frame. And then you could also choose to include a terminal value on the exit month or not. If you hit yes here, it'll take the trailing 12 month revenue multiple times whatever you put in here to get your exit value. Cash sources, mainly the investment required is what the model actually solves for itself. Any extra, um, or if you wanted a reserve, you could use the startup cost to do so here. But the model solves for minimum cash position of uh, zero based on all the assumptions. Debt, if you put zero here, you can see that investment requirement will rise. If you get some debt, minimum investment goes down. Now, the minimum investment required, we've got the cap table here. This is So this is, again, what we're solving for in the whole model. And the amount you're raising, you could put in here from different investors. You could enter the percentages they share of the company. This fill here is just going to take whatever hasn't been entered of this amount in any of these other raised, you know, if you haven't raised money from anything else, it'll just all go into here. Same with the percentage. And these percentages and these dollar amounts in each of these top columns 
if you add them to the bottom columns, they should the percentages should add up to 100, and the amounts should add up to no larger than this. If you did put more money in here than what was required, you would just have a little bit of an excess cash balance. So that's investment requirement, uh, and then you've got total investor equity, owner equity, um, equity and debt percentages, and we do account for taxes, operating taxes, as well as long-term capital gains. If you have a lot of fixed equipment, this will be a little bit more relevant. Uh, and then a big one here, you can account for collecting cash up front or not. So if you were raising, or sorry, if you were onboarding annual customers, as well as month-to-month -month customers, you might collect the 12-month value of that contract up front. That's a big, you know, you can see the minimum cash requirement is at 729000 If I hit no on here, you can see that goes up to $2 million. So especially for a startup, that can really offset burn and give you a much better cash position if you are collecting cash receipts up front. That will also affect on the balance sheet, you'll have unearned revenue. This is cash collected before your services have been provided. So a liability account, and then um, if you hit no here, then you'll recognize, well, you'll the cash will come in evenly over the contract term, however long that might be. For this scenario, we'll put in yes. And now let's really get into it. So the revenue assumptions are quite complex. We have four tiers here. We also have assumptions for traffic. And we have assumptions for a couple of the revenue streams, transaction fees, if the platform is going to facilitate transactions. Maybe the platform earns a percentage of all those facilitated transactions. Also, you might have one-time or affiliate revenue on new signups, so that can be accounted for. So there's a couple new income streams here, a little bit of a different setup. Let's jump into the first one. So here, the general style I did for this, uh, so for the AI-powered financial advisory platform, is a standard tier or basic, and then a that's month-to-month, -month, and then an annual version of that paid every 12 months or contract of 12 months. And then a premium tier, that's month to month, and a premium uh, tier that's paid uh, once a year. Now, you don't have to use that same structure. You could label these however you want, and they will update through the model. You see if I put basic here, it updates on this, and it'll update everywhere. Um, but right now, we just label it standard. And these contract lengths, so this is month to month by just putting a 1 in here, or if, they, if customers pay every 3 months, you can put a 3. Um, the main thing that's tied to the contract length is obviously the, the value of the contract. So if it's month to month and you put $20 in here, then they're paying $20 a month. Also, the retention rate, this 90% here is applied to each renewal after the contract term. So if it's one month, then every month this is saying that you're losing 10% of the customers that joined. You can adjust all of these assumptions each year and you can improve the assumption amount so here we're saying it, we improve our retention by one percent we end up getting from 90 percent to 93 percent retention has an exponentially greater effect to the higher your it goes and remember these so retention rate in year two has nothing to do with the customer that joined in year one this is actually a dynamic schedule that applies to only the customers that joined in the given year. And the point of that, obviously, is to say that as your platform improves, you make it better. The idea is that your customers are going to stay longer. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a second. Um, let's keep moving down through the top of this. So, so you can define the start month that the tier begins, the contract length in this case is monthly so we'll do a one here ad spend so this is the model allows you to do ad spend specifically for each tier as well as the free tier um, right here we do traffic uh, where customers added through the free tier as well 
and then a cost per acquisition improvement in your cost per acquisition so as that goes down you acquire more customers for the same cost so you can do this for each specific tier or and you could zero these out if you don't want to do your ad spend per tier and on the opex tab at the bottom you can actually define a annual ad spend here annual cost per acquisition and then this new these new customers you can define the percentage of those that join each of your tiers so i've seen clients ask both ways and so you've got the option to do it by customer tier with the ad spend or as an overall general ad spend and you just define the percentage of those customers that fall into each tier over time these should add up to 100 percent assuming you're spending all of your i mean yeah the, these should always add up to 100 uh, percent you don't have to use every tier but whatever you do use um they should should just the some of these should be 100 percent okay so we did ad spend contract value explained and so if this is 12 here in this case we're saying customers now the contract value is 199 dollars so these customers that sign up pay 199 up front because we're saying the customers are collect you're collecting receipts up front if it no it'd be spread evenly over the contract but we are collecting it up front we still need to know the monthly value because we're recognizing that revenue on the income statement evenly over the contract term so we need to know what the monthly amount is there's offsets for that on the cash flow statement you can see here you're adding the upfront collections reducing the mrr monthly recurring revenue uh, receipts uh, there's also this assumption percentage increase in contract value at renewal so this says every time a customer renews is there an increase to the amount that they're paying uh, now this is not like an increase in price necessarily um, it might be more for uh, bigger customers where you just maybe they're 12 12 or 24 month customers where they have a big contract and you're increasing that value um, generally though this can be zero percent and you could see it will affect our standard revenue a little bit it was at 30 million at zero at one percent what was that at 31 million so a little, a little bit of a difference here for the default we'll zero these out that is also something that allows you to get negative churn because you can actually have more revenue from the customers that stayed and increased their average revenue per account per month went up higher than what the revenue per month lost was from the customers that left so this is allows you to see what has to be true about the contracts in order for negative churn to happen that's mainly why this input was added all righty well that's everything so for each of these tiers and there's four of them and again i structured it like a monthly and an annual version of two different pricing tiers you can structure it however you want they don't have to be connected this could be a you know just a, a low medium high best tier or however or you don't even have to use every tier you can just use one of them or two however you want it's completely up to you but the idea is the assumptions are flexible to handle any situation that you have okay so we've got those four tiers down here for traffic you can also define the start month traffic begins your monthly organic traffic and the monthly growth in traffic adjustable by year so this says we're starting at 1200 then in month two which in this case would be march of 2025 because we're starting in february or do one percent more than 1200 in traffic and so on so you can get the exponential growth here is that traffic number going across the top of the monthly detail tab over time and then that traffic converts based on these assumptions here so conversion of organic traffic to free to the free pool conversion of organic traffic to paid customers directly so that's just saying some of this traffic you can convert it right to a paid customer some of it goes to a free pool 
and then you could also define of your free pool how much of that the balance of those users signs up for a paid account each month at the end of the month you're also defining how much you want to spend on ads for free conversions per month so this would tie directly to um, this ad spend here this ad spend is the general ad spend that we talked about where we're spreading it um, defining the percentage of that that goes to each customer from here so there's two different ad spends for each of these tiers the one I'm talking about now for the free pool is this ad spend. So we're acquiring 1998 customers a month of free customers based on this. You also define of the new customers that sign up, um, how much are going to each of the four paid tiers. And this applies both to customers that are coming from the free pool over. And this is from the balance of the free pool as well as the customers that are coming directly from traffic to paid so the so if you had 100 new free customers in this case five of them you're saying would sign up directly to um from the tr sorry if you had 100 um visitors to your website it would say five of those visitors are going to sign up directly to paid um 0.5 percent are going to sign up to the free pool and then your free pool balance, which is this here, end of end of monthly customers, a 0.5% of those are going to sign up to a paid pool. And the amount that are going to the paid pool from there, as well as from directly from traffic, is the same percentages, which is this these four here. So these should also add up to 100%. So you're just finding how customers are entering the paid pool from the free pool, as well as from traffic based on these percentages. Uh, now the free pool also needs a retention rate. So here we're saying um, the monthly retention of the free pool is 98%, which will drive your customers lost each month of the free pool. Okay, so that's the recurring revenue aspect. We also have transaction fees. So this is if the platform facilitates users to transact, the platform make it a small percentage of those transactions facilitated. So in order to account for all that, we have the amount and note that the free pool might also count in this. So you have the expected um, value per transaction by customer pool, the amount of fees collected per customer pool by the platform. So this is going to drive revenue. And then your average amount of transactions facilitated by customer type. So your revenue is just the total transaction value times the count per month times this percentage will drive revenues for the platform based on transaction fees. And <clears throat> these will all be applied dynamically to the customer counts in each of the tiers. Now that, so this is all your recurring customers here consolidated view of all your paid customers churn monthly churn standard mrr all the way to premium so these are the four different mrr or subscription tiers we have the revenue uh, and churn of those in dollars and again that could be negative potentially total recurring revenue average monthly recurring revenue per customer and Av or annual run rate. So this is taking your monthly recurring revenue times 12. So this just says if I had if I stayed at 441,000, then in 12 months I'd have 5.2 million. So that's what annual run rate is. Now here's what I just described with the transaction fee. So the count of transactions, the volume, and then the fees earned by the platform. Then you have affiliate revenue, or this could be affiliate revenue or uh, one-time fee revenue. And it's just applied to the amount of new customers that uh, um, are subject to this and their average spend per sign-up. And there's only, they can only do it once. It's basically like a one-time fee. So you define that, what that amount is and um, the amount of customer, new customers that actually participate. So here we have customer participating and then the total value of all their one-time fees. Then we have total revenue here, and now we've covered all of the revenue aspects. 
This configuration would fit a wide range of B to C cases. I would say 95%. You could you could do um, a, a B to C model for a, uh, so many different businesses. You know, four tiers, varying contract lengths, and everything's configurable. Also with the traffic, the free pool, and then having these other fees in uh, revenue streams. That covers nearly every customization I've ever done on this model as well. So I'm trying to get every, uh, on the old version of it that, well, it's a, not old, I'd say it's a different version of it. That's a little bit more basic. Um, but I'm really, I'm excited to get this out because this is, this is robust. Okay, so let's go to customer service. So in this tab, there's four four tiers and you could define the customer service reps required per tier. And it's based on the ongoing count of customers that exist in each tier. And you just put in the ratio of how many uh, customer reps are required per existing customer here. If you put 0 0.001, in this case, that means you need one customer service rep per 1000 customers. And so it'll do the math on that and on the monthly detail here. See customer reps are right here. And that's based on these counts. So you've got each of your tiers, the reps required. So here you can see the math is happening based on the count of customers in standard tier times that ratio. And that's how we're getting the required reps needed. Remember, it was like one for every thousand. So here we've got 1,500 customers. So we need 1.5 reps. And decimals in this case are completely fine for projections. Now that works for every tier the same way for customer service reps. So you can scale. That's because usually you'll scale your reps as your P2C SaaS business grows. And you don't want to have to think about how many reps you need. Uh, defining these ratios and salaries is a more efficient way to get you the model works, you know, very accurately that way. And you don't have to think as much. So we've got four tiers there, customer service reps. And this just allows you to define two different types of reps if applicable. If not, you can always just zero out one of them and just by entering zero in the input there and it just zeroes out the tier sales reps work very similar way you've got different sales reps potentially for each customer type and this is based on the amount of new customers added per month and how many reps you need for that so here if i put 0.01 it means i need one sales rep for every 100 customers now you might not have sales reps at all in that case you would just zero all these out and there's no sales reps so it's flexible in that regard. Adjust, adjust assumptions each year. And these are fully loaded annual salaries, meaning it includes payroll taxes, ta benefits, all of that stuff. And there are two types per each tier that you can define. If maybe one's a account executive, maybe one's a sales director. Now we get into the operating expenses. So Sales and marketing is going to have a lot of different pieces. We already went over some of the ad spend costs that would also fall into sales and marketing. We've got the fixed costs here, which would be more for salaried uh, corporate employees, you know, vice president of marketing, product managers, um, some other things that might fall under that. There's 32 potential items here. And each one you could define the name, the start month, and the annual salary or annual cost and then the model will take that whatever that cost is in a given year and divide it by 12 to get the monthly amount you've got that for sales and marketing gna same same idea just different labels r d same thing different labels now i also did a fixed cost area for cost of goods sold because you might it might be easier to enter like if you have agreements that say your your web hosting costs are going to be, be X in each year, you can put that in here. Um, but there's also cost of goods sold defined by the cost per customer per month, which you can define here. 
So this is if you had 100 customers in tier one in year one, it'd be three dollars a month per customer. So if it was 100 customers, it'd be three hundred dollars a month. Same goes for the other tiers. Same logic. We've also got cost of goods sold as a function of revenue. And then we've also got some GNA costs as a function of revenue. So these are in two separate areas and I've added them because it's, it's been asked to do this before and it's I think it's a good idea to have that functionality. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so we went over sales and marketing, GNA, R&D, cost of goods sold here, then these two. Okay, and then the last part, ad marketing, ad or marketing spend. This is your general cost that you're spending on ads and you're just defining the percentage of customers that go to each tier based on that spend and your CPA. We went over this a bit earlier as well. Alrighty, debt option, very simple. It's just, you can have the option to take out some debt to cover your initial working capital. Um, startup costs, you can put in the amount on a global control that comes into here. On the actual debt tab, you can define the term of the loan, interest rate, payments per year, and the first payment date, and that will drive all of the logic into the model. CapEx, so this could be important. It depends if you're if you're B2C SaaS, you might be buying servers, equipment, different things with depreciation life, so you can define those cost bases here. Maybe you buy your office building um, you can put those costs in here, a useful life, and then the month that that spend happened, and that will flow through to the model. If you're not using any of these, you can zero out all the assumptions in yellow. Make sure you also zero out the, this value at sale for the initial building. This other information here is more for accounting, and it's to figure out your cost basis at exit. If you are going to include terminal value, then there'll be some taxable basis here depending on the book value and the value at sale um, all that logic is automated you don't really need to worry about it if the sales mostly just going to be recognized as extraordinary income meaning taxable at your regular corporate tax rate you just put 100 percent here and this would not be relevant cap table we went over this so again you're just putting in how much you're raising of your minimum cash from different people outside investor section here's your inside investor section you could also put in uh, if you have class a and b shares this is pretty rare usually users are just using these top these first two columns here startup costs so these are other one-time costs maybe legal fees uh consultants what have you and you might be so the these hit rate in month one of the model and they could be zero if it's not relevant terminal value we just went over and so those are all the assumptions i want to go to the income statement so here we have our three revenue streams subscription revenues from all the different recurring revenue tiers transaction spell transaction wrong i o n transaction-based revenue, one-time fee revenue, total revenue. Then for cost of goods sold, I separated it into the cost per active customer, which kind of follows this style. So we've got cost of goods sold here based on active customer. We also have the fixed costs here that are cost of goods sold. Um, and then we have some as a function of total revenue. And then we also are assuming customer service reps fit in there. So those four different types are all represented here, so you can kind of see a high level. General and administrative costs, sales and marketing, R&D, your one-time startup costs, and then you've got EBITDA, interest, depreciation, and then just net income. You've got your exit value happening here. Income statement annual, same deal, but on an annual basis. All the numbers flow through and all this is dynamic if you were to change your assumptions balance sheet we've got your cash fixed assets accumulated depreciation total assets liabilities honored revenue and debt equity raised retained earnings and then all those balance out
balance sheet annual, same deal, but on an annual basis. Cash flow, the only really tricky thing here is we do have a reduction of any upfront collections. Now you can see if I entered no on the upfront collection and went back to the cash flow statement, now that those items are irrelevant and you just have your total revenue from uh, customers happening in the top here. Cash flow statements kind of like your sources and uses. You can kind of see how you're getting money coming in, when, when it's going out. Cash flow statement annual. Let me put this back to yes. Now the executive summary is a little bit more detailed, but it's high level. Um, a little bit more detailed than the income statement. So at the top, we've got year ending free and paid customers. You've got your revenue from each type. You've got cost of goods sold. We did go over that. Um, the one difference here is you've got your sales and marketing spend is separated between ad spend, sales reps, and fixed costs. So this gives you a little bit more visibility into where the sales and marketing spend is coming from, as well as what the percentage of revenue it represents. Then we get down to EBITDA, you have debt service coverage, might be relevant or not. Taxes, CapEx, all these other cash flow items, and then this reconciles to the same cash flow we calculated in the rest of the model. Here's the check for that right here. I also showed the year ending ARR, meaning the monthly recurring revenue on the last month of each year times 12 is what this is. And then the total churn that's happening in each year from customers leaving. We've got some charts, other uh, project level and investor and owner level return metrics. And remember investor is just on the cap table, this top section and re represents the, the entire investor section. Owner section would be like founders, maybe employees that would fit in the bottom section of the cap table. And these are the respective returns here. There's also a discounted cash flow analysis for the project level, as well as the investor and owner groups. And you could adjust the discount rates here accordingly. The higher the, the dis discount rate, the more risky the business is. Basically, if you want the easiest way to think about what you should put in for that. Um, how risky are the cash flows, basically. And that'll the higher the rate is, the lower the net present value. You can see here, if we were to plug our IRR into here, the net present value would be zero, as that's what the definition of IRR is. You can check that calculation. So that's what the future cash flows would have to be discounted down to to equal the initial investment. Okay, we've got a visual on this. More visuals, so key yearly stats, revenue, gross profit, EBITDA, yearly cash flow, monthly cash flow, cumulative cash flow by month, uh, month any customers all, month any customers by tier. And these are paid customers, um, not the free tier. We've also got month any customers by tier and just a percentage of the total, like a stack percentage chart. Monthly recurring revenue by tier. So this is your total revenue, total monthly recurring revenue, not you've also got revenue from other sources. But how you're, much you're getting from each of the four different paid tiers of just the subscription, not the other stuff. And then here you actually see the other stuff, which is also, so you've got recurring revenue, transaction fee revenue, and one-time referral fee. So you can see the breakdown of revenue by source, and then here's breakdown of subscription revenue by customer type. So this is just showing a detailed version of basically only this, this first section here. Then you've got customer acquisition cost, average monthly revenue per account, average monthly gross revenue per account. This average monthly revenue per account is taking into account the revenue from all sources, not just subscriptions. And then the gross profit, gross revenue per account is just taking that number of time to gross profit for the month. You've also got average months to pay back to customer acquisition cost, average monthly churn, Average monthly churn in dollars, average life of a customer in years. Let me put a note on that one. In 
years. Average lifetime value and lifetime value to CAC ratio. And all of those are actually being calculated here on the monthly detail down at the bottom under key metrics. Uh, so customer acquisition costs, we're calculating that by taking the total sales and marketing divided by the new customers added, uh, the new paid customers added in the month. Now, I think to me, that's even though you're so you're you're not counting the new free customers, but you kind of are because you're counting the costs to acquire those free customers. But you're only saying a customer is a new customer if they're a paying customer. So this is saying it costs you one hundred twenty nine dollars to sign up a paid customer. Then average revenue per account is all the revenues divided by all of the paid customers. Gross revenue is just taking that to find the gross profit months to pay back is then based on the gross profit against that customer acquisition cost. So it's taking you two months to recover your um, CAC per gross profit generated by the account. Churn, dollars churned, average life of a customer in years, average lifetime value using the gross profit. So saying the customer's worth about $1,500. And then our, that's 11 times the customer acquisition cost. So that's where we get this, this number, LTV to CAC. I've also got some weights here. This was used to calculate um, the average life of a customer because we got four different customer types and I weighted them uh, based on essentially revenue per tier and then the average life in years of each customer type against the contract length. Well, the contract length defines this in combination of the retention rate. Uh, Active months, so this is just a calculation for the exit, and then this is a reconciliation for collecting cash flow up front. Now, don't go away, there's more, and you want to pay attention to this last part. If we go over to validation tab, this section you may want to manually define your retention of each customer pool. And you can see the four pools here, paid customers and the free pool at the end. And what I mean by that is, this is just assuming a straight average retention. So if I put 90% retention, it's going to do, um, it's going to look at what the month number is. And so here on yearly, the retention is 80% on month 13. So we've got all the customers and then in a year, they only 80% re-sign up. Year after that, only 60%, 40%, etc. of the initial sign-up count. You can manually override this if you think it's exponential decay or if it follows some other pattern and you want that to change over time as well. You can adjust that manually on this tab if you don't want to use the assumptions here, which are just you put in the initial amount and it's just going to extrapolate that based on the contract term length and this number and just evenly distribute it. You know, in this case, you're losing 10% of your customers every month that signed up in month one. And this is a general average way to do it. There's no one way that's best. It just depends on the business. And if you have data on the business that defines a specific pattern, you know, maybe it's a hundred percent, and then the, the next renewal, you're at 70, and then maybe 35, and then it slowly peters out to like 5%, and maybe you stay at like 5% for the rest of the model. That's fine. You could define whatever pattern you want the customers to go through here, and that will automatically update in the entire model. I did label these, um, so you've got the re each one's the same renewal count. And the reason why we want to know the renewal count is because potentially we are increasing the revenue. So if I were to put say 5% here, then it would increase 5% and let's go back. You can see now it's increasing every time there's a renewal, the renewal 
counts happening here. Here's our multiple of the initial contract value that we're getting at each renewal. So in this case, in month to month, um, every month we're getting a little bit more out of the low, quite a bit more. 5% is pretty high. So that's what that number is doing. Now, if the renewal is every, you know, the renewal count is still the same in this annual contract section. So the renewal counts the same, but the month that the renewal happens is different. And that is, and you can see if we go to matrix two, and we go down here, the percentage of cohort remaining is the same until month 13. Boom, then we, we lose some. And you can see also the renewal count happening here. This is the average amount of contract value being earned churn amount churn you see the amount churn is only happening every 12 months for annual customers then you've got the actual cash coming in and this is taking into account the increase in the contract value of all the customers that stay as well as reducing the customers that have left and this amount you know so this cohort of customers you potentially could have more revenue from them the ones that stay, if this was high enough, let's say it was at um, some crazy high number, let's say 50% more. Sorry, we're on, we're looking at the uh, annual contract. Let's say this is 50% more here. Go to matrix two. Yeah, now you have a negative churn in, in this tier. You have more revenue from the customers that are still there than what you lost. And we should see that effect Go to the monthly detail. So we have a, a churn of customer count, but the actual dollars churned is negative. So negative churn is actually a good thing. So this is an interesting number that you might want to play with. Put this back to zero. Okay. Well, that's all I got for you. Now, this will be included if you want to download the template. Links in the description. It's included in, if you go to smarthelping.com, I'll put it in the um, SaaS and tech library. It'll be an as a service model right up here. It'll also be included in, let's see, let me see any other bundles I might want to put it in. Accounting. Maybe, and I'm gonna charge uh, $99 for this template, one-time fee. What to put it in? I don't know if there's anything else that fits it. Probably just the SAS, SAS bundle, just in here. I'll also put it on the Super Smart bundle, which includes all the templates on the whole site. So $99 and you get everything I've built, which are just, you know, I've got well over 200 templates now that are, Similar to what you saw I just went through today, but just for different industries. Um, you can check those out on the site. This is what I do for a living. If you want to hire me, <laughs> you can. I do financial modeling uh, consulting work. I build from scratch. I modify what you have. I can modify what I have. My general rate's 275 an hour. Usually, most jobs are between three and six hours. You can see I've got a bell curve. I update this, update this every three or four months. You can see most jobs just happen to be in this range of, you know, under $2,000, usually actually under 1000 for a lot of these, and under, you know, we're looking at like five hours. This would be 10 hours, so around that that two to five hour mark is, is where most people land. Um, but yeah, I'm available. I do this stuff every day all day so let me know you can email me right up here jstansmarvelling.com let me know i'll see you guys on the next one like and subscribe